Um, anyhow, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a privilege for me to welcome you all to today's auspicious webinar for our nation's Constitution Day, or Samvidan Divas, organized by the Department of Political Science, also known as National Law Day. It was on 26th November in 1949 that India adopted its constitution and it officially came into effect on the 26th of, February, of January, sorry, 1950. In the words of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, however good the constitution may be, if those who are implementing it are not good, it will prove to be bad. However bad a constitution may be, if those implementing it are good, it will prove to be good. Today, like every year, we gather here to celebrate, to commemorate this historic day as a nation, to remind us of the India that we hold sacred, of the India that we are a part of, and this constitution that has held together this fine nation for so long since its, since its conception. Without further ado, allow me to highlight the order of today's program. Chairpersons Keshaviko, BA first semester, and Imli Kamla, BA fifth semester, Department of Political Science. First off, we have Dr. Aniruddha Barber, who will grace us with a welcome note, followed by Dr. Rimei, Head of Department of Political Science and Chief Convener, will be enlightening us on the Constitution and its profound value. As for the third item, a short speech by Assistant Dean, Mr. Anjan K. Behera, after which the students of Tetzel College will be presenting some speeches of their own on the theme, The Constitution of India, My Pride, My Identity, followed very closely by I think the most important aspect of today's webinar. Dr. Samragi Chakraborty, our esteemed guest, will grace the event by talking about the Constitution Day. We will also be having a mass reading of the preamble of the Constitution by the participants, led by Chairperson Imli Kamla. And to close it off, we will have some few words of thanks by Dr. V. Vijaya Chamundeswari. If I find the constitution being misused, I shall be the first to burn it. B. R. Ambedkar. To warmly address a welcome note, I would like to give to thine to our respected convener, Dr. Aniruddha Papar. Sir, please take your time. Thank you, Madam. Chairperson, I would like to begin my speech, my sharing, with a poem written by Rabindranath Tagore in his Gitanjali. Where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come out from the depth of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into dreary desert stand of dead habit, where the mind is laid forward by thee, into ever widening thought and action, into the haven of freedom, my father, let my country awake. Let my country awake. Let my country awake. Chief guest for today, most respected, honored, learned, Dr. Samragi Chakraborty, Professor of Law, Ajinkya Dewey Patel University, Pune. Honorable Principal Professor P. S. Lorin, Vice Principal 
Dr. Hevasa Lorin, Director Shrikulo Lorin, Madam Dean S. Alika Asumi, Assistant Dean Sri Anjan Behra, Head of the Department of Political Science, Dr. Rimai Longmai, Head of the Departments of different academic departments at Tetso College, dignitaries, colleagues, students, and friends. This is my image to welcome this August gathering on the 71st anniversary of the adoption of the Constitution of India. The Constitution was an attempt to form a bridge between a past of divisions and deprivations and a future dedicated to establishing an equal, just, and fair society based on the ideals of justice, equality, liberty, and fraternity. The Constitution declares India a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic and to secure to all its citizens justice, equal, a social, economic, and political liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith, and worship, equality of status and of opportunity, and to promote among them all fraternity, assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity and integrity of the nation. 26 November is celebrated every year by the Tetsu College as Constitution Day. Today we show our appreciation and respect for the framers of the Constitution, especially their leader, the Supreme Architect of the Constitution of India, Dr. Bhimra Ramji Ambedkar. However, we must at the same time not forget the people who have worked hard to make the constitutional ideals into reality. By their sheer wisdom, prudence, foresight, and diligence, the makers of our constitution under a visionary leadership of Dr. Ambedkar prepared a futuristic and vibrant document that reflects our ideals and aspirations on one hand and protects the future of all Indians on the other. The Constitution of India lies at the foundation of the world's greatest, largest, and most respected as well as celebrated democracy. This is the supreme law in the country's democratic framework, and it continuously guides us in our endeavors. The Constitution is also the fountainhead of our democratic system of governance and our guiding light. Two between the adoption and enforcement of the Constitution was used for a thorough reading and translation from English to Hindi. The Constituent Assembly met for 166 days, spread over two years, 11 months, and 18 days before the Constitution was adopted. The members of the Constituent Assembly signed two handwritten copies of the document, one each in Hindi and English, on January 24th. 1950. Two days later, the Constitution of India became the law of the land. On November 25th, 1949, the day before the Constituent Assembly wound up its proceedings, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar made a moving speech. It ended with three warnings for the future. The first was regarding the place of popular protest in a democracy one must abandon the methods of civil disobedience, non-cooperation, and satyagraha, Dr. Ambedkar said. The second warning dealt with the unthinking submission to charismatic authority. Bhakti in religion may be the road to salvation of the soul, but in politics, bhakti or hero worship is a sure road to degradation and to eventual dictatorship, Dr. Ambedkar quoted. His final warning was that Indians should not be content with political democracy as inequality and the hierarchy were still embedded in Indian society. Quote, if we continue to deny it for long, we will do so only by putting our political democracy in peril. Unquote, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Dear friends, India did not achieve its liberty or prosperity by mistake. It was by design and the architects were the founding fathers. 
let us not mess with the constitution the constitution matters yes constitution matters also in one of his speeches to the constituent assembly dr ambedkar while underlining the importance of constitutional morality emphasizes that the essence of constitutional morality was to regard the constitution as supreme and to follow the constitutionally mandated procedures regarding regardless of any ideological differences all the three organs of the state persons gracing the constitutional post members of the civil society and common citizens of india are expected to abide by constitutional morality let us all remind ourselves without fail that civilized existence is one which respects the law both wise and good laws as well as bad laws whose constitutional basis is the will of the people when one does not like a particular law the remedy resides in modifying it or revoking it or amending it by the procedures established for that very purpose that methodology is the sole means of guaranteeing that popular will cannot be seized and held captive by zealots with their own extreme interpretations the constitution was is and will remain supreme the rule of law shall forever prevail and continue to chart the destiny of all of us the people of india the free people of india lastly i would just like to finish this address by quoting dr b r ambedkar however good a constitution may be if those who are implementing it are not good it will prove to be bad however bad a constitution may be if those implementing it are good it will prove to be good it is our duty while celebrating the constitution to constantly strive to ensure that implementing the same it is one that will continue to prove to be good there is no doubt in my mind that this will be the case thank you and jai hind kuknalim Thank you Dr Aniruddha for welcoming us. I'm sure every one of us here genuinely felt welcome by your welcoming words. Constitution is not a mere lawyer's document. It is a vehicle of life and its spirit is always the spirit of age. With this note I request head of department Dr Remy Longmai to speak about the constitution as a living document. Sir, you may take your time. uh thank you emily uh, our chairperson um i hope i'm audible to all of you uh yes sir good morning everyone uh, and happy constitution day to all well uh we have uh, many exciting speeches before us today from our honorable guest speaker dr samragi chakraborty as a uh, stand professor law, uh, school of law ajanka patil university pune from our assistant dean sir anjan k behra and from our lovely students participants i will not take much of your time for my sharing i would like to begin by thanking all of you for joining us today and also by inviting you all to see with me how the constitution has worked in the last 70 years and how our country india has managed to be governed by the same constitution under the topic constitution as a living document as you all know change is rule or law of nature and it cannot be avoided we all are constantly changing and so is our environment social political economic cultural moral ethical educational technological etc and also our ideas unlike other countries our country india 
has never felt till day the need to rewrite the constitution. A constitution was adopted on 26 November 1949 and its implementation formally started from 26 January 1950. More than 70 years after that, the same constitution continues to function as the framework within which the government of a country operates. We have described, therefore, our constitution as a living document. What does that mean? Almost like a living being, this document keeps responding to the situations and circumstances arising from time to time. Like a li living being, the constitution responds to experience. Even after so many changes in the society, the constitution continues to work effectively because of its ability to be dynamic, to be open to interpretations, and the ability to respond to the changing situation. This is perhaps a hallmark of a democratic constitution. In a democracy, ladies and gentlemen, practices and ideas keep evolving over time and the society engages in experiment according to these. The important point is that our constitution has been able to protect itself and also protect our democracy. In the last 70 years, some very critical situation arose in the politics and constitutional development of the country. In terms of constitutional legal issues, the most serious question that came up again and again from 1950 onwards was about the supremacy of the Indian constitution. But the, cons the, but the contribution of the judiciary, the basic you know, structure theory, and the maturity of the political leadership, including political parties, political leaders, the government, and the parliament itself realized that a balanced and long-term view was necessary and hence accept the idea of inviolable basic structure of the Indian constitutions. All this perhaps helped a constitution to still thrive on. It may be recalled that when the constitution was made, Leaders and people of a country share a common vision of India. A constitution framers and leaders also share this vision of dignity and freedom of the individual, social and economic equality, well-being of all people, unity based on national integrity. This vision has not disappeared. People and leaders alike hold to these visions and hope to realize it. Therefore, the constitution based on these visions has remained an object of respect and authority even after more than half a century. The basic values governing our public you know, imagination remain intact. Politics in the democracy is necessarily full of debates and differences. That is a sign of diversity, liveliness, and openness. Democracy therefore welcomes debates, but it is also about compromises and give and take. And our country, India, is perfectly exhibiting and reflecting this type of politics since independence. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we pay a rich tribute to our constitution makers who were so far-sighted and wise from whom we have inherited a very robust constitution. The basic framework of the constitution is very suited to our nation and we remember them and their far-sightedness that provides many solutions for our future situation.
जय हिंद थैंक यू थैंक यू ऑल very right sir um the constitution has existed for more than 70 years remaining fundamentally unchanged i think this is a sign of the dedication of our forefathers and the greatness of our constitution thank you dr remy for those insightful points following the accordance of today's order of program for the next item i call upon our assistant dean Mr. Anjan K. Behera, to present his speech. You may take the stage, sir. Thank you so much, dear chairperson, and very a very good morning to all of you on this auspicious day, Constitution Day, and it's so great to be a part of this event. Uh, I do welcome each and every one of you to this event, and I would like to thank the Department of Political Science for giving me this opportunity to speak uh, on this day. I do hope. my audio is clear uh, and uh, all right so i do have a few things to share and let me be frank when uh, the department approached me to speak on this day uh, i was not very sure if i should accept now i'm not from the department of of political science uh, but then i realized that that's not how it's going to work as indians each of us must be aware of the constitution and should be aware of the issues surrounding the constitution and so i think today is a celebration of the constitution yes of course but it's also a reminder to each and every one of us to go back and see and view what can what is okay and perhaps what needs to be changed or adapted now as already mentioned by our speakers speakers beforehand our constitution is dynamic it changes with time however is the change fast enough or quick enough that is something that we must deliberate upon to this day as a child as a school ch- child as, as a student i remember uh, this concept this concept of okay, democracy being taught to me at school democracy and we had to learn the spelling by heart and uh, i was not really good at spellings and so i would always make these errors but one thing which always stuck with me was the definition of this term it was a government of the people by the people and for the people and that is what the constitution safeguards that the people are a part of the decision making process and they are taken into account at every level uh and that makes me proud to be an indian of course knowing that we have a say in our government now we might think that the constitution is just something that is there and it's used by the lawyers and it doesn't really affect us but if you want to really understand the impact that a constitution can have in the running of a country take a quick look at how the us elections have turned out joe biden is the president elect right but the constitution provides for donald j trump to challenge the results of the election and he hasn't he hasn't conceded yet now that is the power of the constitution and so it's a very important document something that should that that must be taken seriously today we are we are celebrating our constitution it's a sacred document which safeguards our rights as the citizens of india but one thing is for sure is it enough to just call ourselves a democratic country are we satisfied with the various with the various provisions that are present in our constitution we know that our government is of the people and by the people but it but is it really for the people are we taken into account are our lives really considered when huge huge decisions are made at the center which affects everyone in 2015 the indian prime minister shri narendra modi signed a historic peace accord peace accord with the nscn now this was defined by the prime minister as historic the only thing that makes it historic is that no one knows till date what exactly was in the peace accord and what exactly were the terms that were agreed upon if the accord f- affects the society it affects our state why the secrecy 
Now, these are a few things, these are a few loopholes that have seeped in through the various provisions of our constitution. Now, talking about our prime minister, of course, we all love him. He is dynamic and he has brought in a lot of change to our country. We do like the way that he brings about change, often to sudden and dynamic announcements, much like the way he announced that the 1,000 rupee notes and 500 rupee notes would no longer be valid at around 8 p.m. on 8th of November. And uh, this led to widespread panic all across India. It did resolve the problem of black money to an extent, I agree. But who were the sufferers? It was the common man. Recently, when the lockdowns were imposed, no provisions were made by the government, no direct provisions were made by the government to assist the common common people, the janta. And each of us saw the hardships that they had to undergo, traveling kilometers, walking barefoot, collapsing on the way. And these are certain aspects of our society, our government, which do exist in society today. And we need to reconsider and check if our constitution is so is uh, giving certain elements or certain certain provisions so that these kind of things do not happen in in the future. At the end, the janta should not suffer. However, at the uh, it's always them who do bear the brunt. Secularism is another aspect that is protected by our constitution. India claims to be a secular country, and yet beef has been banned in India. Beef is an integral part of the food culture of several states. We are aware of that. In Nagaland itself, beef is a part of our food culture, and yet it has been banned. How, in what way are we, are, are we secular then? Now, the thing is, uh, we talk about other aspects, for example, rape by a spouse, by a, by a spouse, okay, marital rape. This marital rape as a topic often gets silenced. The Indian law, as far as I'm aware, does not, does not recognize rape by a spouse. It's treated as violence. Now, we have passed a law which bans the sale of beef. However, marital rape has not been recognized in India yet. That's the that these are some of the challenges which do we do need to overcome when it comes to rape of me of men. Now, male survivors of rape have it much worse. Indian law does not recognize male rape, and I do ex do ask you to excuse my dogs over there. They are very excited about the Constitution Day. I guess it does not recognize male rape. Instead, it is termed as unnatural offenses or sodomy. Now, it does not mean that men in India have not been raped. It's more common than we think of. It's just that our constitution does not have enough, enough provisions to give them the justice or to even feel them comfortable enough to come and speak about this issue openly. Yet, the Supreme Court found it much more important to find to pass a law which made it compulsory for movie theaters in India to play the national anthem before the movie is screened. This was made with an aim to make Indians more patriotic, yes, because listening to Janagana Mana just a few minutes, few minutes prior to a film being screened is going to make everyone patriotic. Now, that's the whole point. Our legal system does have certain loopholes, and we need to acknowledge these loopholes because accepting the problem is the first step towards resolving the problem. If you talk about the rights given to the LGBTQI community in India, it has improved significantly. The Article 377 has been altered, thus giving them a little more rights, but yet, uh, that we still have a long way to go even on that front. For example, adoption by a gay couple or a gay man in India is still not legal. Now, that does bring into the question of the whole element of our constitution saying that our government is for the people. How is it for the people if certain segments are being ignored or set aside? 
India is the largest democracy in the world. Let's be aware of that. And we are better off than much other than a lot of other countries in terms of the rights given to our citizens. But yes, we have a long way to go. Our constitution cannot be a stagnant document. Rather, it needs to evolve and change with times. Yes, the Indian government is of the people and by the people, but not always is it for the people. And I don't, and I think that is a huge violation. Rules are good, but if these rules are actually hindering progress in everyday life, what good are they? Instead of pelting us down with water cannons and tear gas, listen to our demands, so that so that they may teach uh, and they may teach our children in school that India is a democracy. But I know the truth, and so do you. And so on this day, Constitution Day, I believe that all of us should take should be aware of the implications of the constitution and strive to make the, our country a better place to live in realize that the constitution has evolved yes but it needs to evolve even more and there are there, and i'm saying that there is a lot of scope for our constitution to if to develop and evolve eventually i do see india becoming a country thanks to our constitution, a country where everyone has equal rights and everyone is happy. Thank you so much. Jai Hind. Thank you, um, Mr. Anjan. That was very insightful and perceptive. We now have presentation of speeches by the students of Tetsuo College who have enthusiastically come forward with their patriotic speeches on the theme, the Constitution of India, my pride, my identity. So to begin this, um, first I'd like to call Zunkum Yumchinger to present his speech. Okay, good morning to you all. Respected our chairpersons, our guest speaker, our dean, our HOD teachers and my friends. I am thankful for this opportunity to give a speech on the annual Constitution Day of India on the team, the Constitution of India, my pride, my identity. I will, I will be speaking on the Constitution of India and fundamental right to education. So let's start here. Education is a fundamental human right and essential for the exercise of all other human rights. It promotes individual freedom and empowerment and yields important development benefits. Yet, millions of children and adults remain deprived of educational opportunities, mainly as a result of poverty. Normative instruments of the United Nations and UNESCO laid down international legal obligations of the right to education. These instruments promote and develop the right to, of every person to enjoy access to education of good quality without discrimination or exclusion. These instruments bear witness to great importance that member states and international community attach to normative actions for realizing the right to education. It is for governments to fulfill their obligations, both legal and political, in regard to providing education for all of good quality and to implement and monitor more effectively education strategies. The judicial decisions from which the right to education emanated as a fundamental right was from the one rendered by the Supreme Court in Mohini Chen versus State of Karnataka. In this case, the Supreme Court threw a division bench comprising of Justice Kuldeep Singh and R. M. Sahai deciding on the constitutional of the practice of charging capitation fee held that the right to education flows directly from the right to life. The right to life and the dignity of an individual cannot be assured unless it is accompanied by the right to education. The rationality of this judgment was further examined by a five judge bench in J.P. Uni Krishnan versus State of Andhra Pradesh, where the enforceability and the extent of the right to education was verified in the following words. 
The right to education further means that a citizen has a right to call upon the state to provide educational facilities to him within the li limits of its economic capacity and development. The same has also been reiterated by the Honorable Supreme Court in Pantua, Mukti, Morcha, etc. versus Union of India, especially referred to the earlier judgment made in his connection as under in Maharashtra State Board of Secondary and Higher Education versus K.S. Kanti, right to education at the secondary stage was held to be a fundamental right. In J.B. Unikrishnan versus State of Andhra Pradesh, a constitution bench had held education up to the age of 14 years to be a fundamental right. It would be therefore incumbent upon the state to provide facilities and opportunities as well as in joint opportunity as enjoined in joint under Article 39 E and F of the Constitution and to, and to prevent exploitation of their childhood due to indigence and vagary. My Constitution secure right to education of every citizen in India. I am proud of the Constitution of India. Thank you, Jay Hint. Thank you, uh, Mr. Zunkam Yimchinger. Next, um, I request Ms. Kinisa Diru Meza to please take her time. Hi there. Uh, can you confirm whether I'm audible? Yes, you're audible. All right, thank you. A respected guest speaker, Dr. Samragi Chakraborty, Principal, Vice Principal, Director, Dean, Assistant Dean, Teachers, and Attendees. It is my privilege to address on this gathering on the 21st anniversary, 71st anniversary of the adoption of the Constitution of India. The Constitution of India provides numerous rights to its citizens. Alongside providing rights, it also seeks for constitutional duties to be fulfilled. I draw my identity in between having the rights and duties which are set out for me to fulfill as a citizen of India. Being belonging to minority group, I draw my strength from the Constitution. It's Article 14 to 17, Article 21, Article 25 to 30, Article 38, Clause 1 and 2, Article 50A, Clause E, Article 350AB, etc., stands as a lighthouse to me. At this juncture, I am reminded of the words of Dr. Rajender Prasad, the President of the Constituent Assembly, spoken exactly 71 years ago on 26 November 1949. I quote We have prepared a democratic constitution, but successful working of democratic institutions requires in those who have to work them willingness to respect the viewpoints of others, capacity for compromise and accommodation, unquote. I strongly believe that strengthening the constitution requires improving the functioning and maintenance of the constitutional institutions. Lastly, I would just like to finish this address by quoting Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, I quote, however good a constitution may be, if those who are implementing it are not good, it will prove to be bad. However bad a constitution may be, if those implementing it are good, it will prove to be good, unquote. It is our duty as a citizen or citizens of India, while celebrating the constitution to constantly strive to ensure that in implementing the same, it is one that will continue to prove to be good. There is no doubt in my mind that this will be the case. Thank you, and Jay Hint. Thank you, Ms. Kinesitil. Um, up next, Ms. Abeni Yantan.
Miss Abeni Yantan, please take your time. Morning to you all, respected guest speaker, Samaragi Chakraborty, VP, deans, professors, and all the attendees. It is my immense pleasure and honor to deliver a speech on this 21st annual celebration, Constitution Day celebration. Constitution of India and the rights of indigenous people. In India, 461 ethnic groups are recognized as Shield tribes and they are India's indigenous people. It is not defined in the Constitution of India as to which person belong to Shiddal tribes and which are those which belong to Shiddal caste, but Article 341 and Article 342 empowers the President to make a list of those castes and tribes after consultation with the governor of respective states. India has several constitutional laws which recognize indigenous people and their rights are as follows. 1. Protection of economic and political rights. To protect the economic rights of the indigenous people, we have Article 244, which deals with the administration of scheduled area and tribal area. Article 275 also empowers Parliament to make special grants given to the state which undertakes the scheme of development for the purpose of promoting the welfare of scheduled tribes. To protect the political rights of the tribal, we have Article 244, Article 330, Article 344, Article 371, and Article 164, Close 1. Article 164, Close 1, which empowers the state to establish the special ministry for the shadow tribes in the state like Chandigarh, Madhya Pradesh, and Orissa. We also have fifth and sixth shadow, which ensures proper control and administration of shadow tribes and their area. Two, National Commission for Shadow Tribes. This commission was formed through Constitution 89th Amendment Act 2003. It comprises of vice chairperson and three full-time members, including one female member. The term of all the members of the commission is three years from the date of exemption of charge. The duty of this commission is to inquire into complaints with respect to deprivation of their rights and also to safeguard them. They also monitor all their matter under the constitution or any other law. The commission also takes part in advising the development of FTs and also to evaluate their development progress. Three, various acts for their protection. Shadow cause and shadow tribe prevention of atrocities act 1985 and 1995 is to protect them from any discrimination and from any kind of torture. The Shadow Tribes Bonded Labor Abolition Act 1976 is to protect them from bonded labor and other practices where less money is given to them for their work. We also have Forest Conservation Act 1918 to protect and conserve the trees as these tribes are dependent on them. So, Supreme Court and High Court case. In the case of M.C. Valsala versus State of Kerala, a rule was struck down by the Supreme Court. The rule states that if any children goes for intercaste marriage and if any of the parents belong to ST or ST category, can claim for any reservation benefit. But for that, they need to show that the person is handicapped and disadvantaged on being born as member of ST or ST family. In the case of state of Madras versus Champakam, Dora region, a government order was held null and void so as to help the backward classes. Along with this, a clause 4 was also added in the Article 15 so that state can make special provisions for the advancement of socially and educationally backward classes. Constitution of India secures, protects, and defends rights of me and my people. I am safe in this country. I am proud Indian, Jay Hind. Thank you, Ms. Abedi. Um, next, uh, I request Mr. Pution and Jamir to take his time. Hello, am I audible to everyone? Yes, you're audible. Okay, thank you. First of all, a very good morning to everyone. Respected 
chairperson, our principal, VP, dean, guest or speaker, professors, and all my dear friends. I'm Mr. Budyodon, Jamir, BA, first, fifth semester, Department of Political Science. would like to deliver a short speech on the topic, the Constitutions of India and Article 32. A mere enumeration of rights, even if it is meticulously worded, is not enough. What is needed is a provision for its enforcement and avenue for redressal. Article 32 of the Indian Constitution enshrines these provisions, whereby individuals may seek redressals for the violations of their fundamental rights. Article 32 falls under Part 3 of the Constitution that includes the fundamental rights of individuals. It allows an individual to approach the Supreme Court if she or he believed that her or, her or his fundamental rights have been violated or they need to be enforced. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar had once said, if I was asked to name any particularly article in this constitution as the most important, an article without which this constitution will be a nullity. I could not refer to any article except this one, Article 32. It is the very soul of the Constitution and the very heart of it. The rights guaranteed under Article 32 cannot be suspended unless provided for by the Constitution. My right to constitutional remedies has been well fortified by Article 32. I am proud of Constitutions of India. Thank you. Jai Hind. Thank you, Mr. Putionen. Um, up next, I use up. Good morning. My audible to everyone. Uh, yes, you're audible, but I think I'd recommend you turn off your camera. Okay, okay, sure. Okay, then good morning, everyone. Good morning to all respected our guest speaker, our director, our principal, our vice principal, and our teachers, our respected teachers, and my fellow brothers and sisters present here today. And it is an honor for me to be speaking on this day, the Constitution Day um, of uh, of our country. And I would like to speak a little bit on the Constitution of India, a charter of economic justice. Now the expression social and economic justice involves the concept of economic, involves the concept of distributive justice, which also, which implies the removal of inequalities and rectifying the injustice resulting from dealing or transaction between unequals in the society. Now, it isn't just about lessening of inequality by different taxation, giving debt relief or regulation of contractual relation. It comprehends more than that. It also means the restoration of properties to those who have been deprived of it by unreasonable bargains. It may also take the form of forced distribution of wealth as a means of achieving as a means of achieving or a fair division of material resources among members of the society. Now, in this present era, a social welfare state is the need of the hour. But not every state no, or no state can become a welfare state unless and until it provides social, economic, and political justice to its citizens and its subjects. Now, the draftsmen of the Indian Constitution enshrined provisions in the Constitution, keeping in mind the view of this welfare state. Now, even the language of the preamble of the Indian Constitution contains the essence of the word, which states that it is an obligation upon the state to secure to all its citizens social, economic, and political justice. To, end, to ensure the object of the preamble, the Indian Constitution also provides many provisions to ensure to secure economic justice to its citizens. 
the Indian Constitution, in its preamble, the fundament and the fundamental rights, and in the directive principles, have solemnly promised to all its citizens justices, social, economic, political justices, liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith, and worship, equality of status, and also of opportunity, and to promote among all fraternity, assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity of the nation. Therefore, my constitution is a document of rights and social justice, and I am proud of it. Thank you, Jehin. Thank you, Mr. Hari Yusuf. Uh, we've been informed that for the participant, Mosa Sangtam, Ms. Kenny Sidir Meza will be taking his speech. So, Ms. Kenny, please take your time. Yes, may I confirm again that I am audible? <laughs> of course, uh, you're audible, clearly. All right, thank you. Uh, yes, Mosa, my very good friend, he has some network issues, so he couldn't uh, tune in for the speech. I will uh, read out his speech to for all of us here. It is titled, Dr. B. R. M. Bedkar, the architect of Cons Constitution, the father of modern India. November 26 is celebrated as the Constitution Day or the Samvidhan Day of India. It is celebrated to commemorate Dr. B. R. Ambedkar's birth anniversary, remembering his contribution in the formation of the Constitution of India. Prime Minister Narendra Modi marked this day as the Constitution Day of India on November 19. 2015, while laying the foundation stone of Anbaker Memorial in Mumbai. It was marked as a part of a year-long celebration of 125th birth anniversary of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, the chairman of the drafting committee of Constituent Assembly. The aim of declaring November 26 as the Constitution Day of India is to spread awareness on the importance of the Indian Constitution and to spread awareness about the life and work of its architect, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Let us understand that Dr. Ambedkar did more than drafting the Constitution. He was also a revered civil rights leader. Born a Dalit, a social classification formerly called untouchable, the lowest position in the Hindu caste system, he suffered discrimination throughout his life. However, nothing could stop him, his unflinching attitude, unceasing dedication, never-ending zeal ultimately led him to complete his formal education from prestigious universities. He entered into many professions as a professor in a college to educate the masses, a lawyer in a court to deliver justice, a reformer in society to liberate his people, to regain self-respect and self-dignity, who were subjugated and treated by higher caste Hindus as subhumans for centuries. Subsequently, in 1936, he wrote the influential pamphlet, Annihilation of Caste, a blistering argument against the in ancient caste ancient system of social stratification. Again in 1947, Baba Sahib Ambedkar hammered out the Indian constitution's integral principles of democracy, equality and freedom of religion. He also inserted sections prohibiting caste-based discrimination and legally outlawing the practice of untouchability. Historians remarked that his legacy as a social political reformer has had a profound effect on modern India. He is often credited with representing a new kind of ambition in India, one that focused on lifting up the lower caste. Dr. Ambedkar was solely responsible in making India an egalitarian, secular, democratic, free nation. It is indisputably true that the modern India is standing strong on the shoulders of Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar. His contribution to our land, our great nation will be remembered forever. 
Long live Dr. Ambedkar. Long live Constitution of India. Long live Republic of India. Jai Hind. So this is from my friend Mosa Santam. Um, at this juncture, I take uh, this very opportunity to encourage all the attendees over here and uh, to read the Constitution with the true spirit and the right spirit to understand uh, the core value that is embedded in this for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kinesidio. Um, my warmest appreciation and sincerest thanks goes out to the students for the exuberant speeches and for wholeheartedly participating. Um, Chairperson Ms. Imli Kamla, over to you. Moving on to the most important part of program. Today, we have with us a phenomenon, compassionate and an honorable Dr. Samraji Chakrapurdri, Assistant Professor, School of Law, Hajanga, Divai Badil University, Bune, who have joined us to be a part of, part of this Virgil Constitution Day celebration. Ma'am, it's a pleasure to have you with us today, and we are keen to hear commemorative speech from you. I request you to take the time. Thank you so much for your lovely introduction. At the outset, I would like to extend my greetings to every one of you on the occasion of Constitution Day. It is indeed a matter of pride and great joy as India and as citizen because we are celebrating the 71st Constitution Day. In the words of late Justice Krishna Iyer, the Constitution of India is not only the supreme law of the land, but it is indeed a way of life. November 26, 1949, marked a new beginning for India as the Constitution of India was adopted by the Constituent Assembly on that day. This very Constituent Assembly was constituted in November 1946 for the very purpose of framing the Constitution. This Constituent Assembly created on 29th of August 1947, a drafting committee that was to consider the draft of the Constitution. The chairman of the drafting committee was none other than Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. And the draft of the Indian Constitution was completed and adopted on 26th January 1950. The framers framed the constitution within a very short span of time with a zeal so that they could cherish our idols, so that they could uphold our freedoms. The framers of the Indian constitution framed the constitution that actually upheld and fulfilled the cherished ideals and aspirations of the people of the country. The Constitution of India, which is, uh, you know, the largest written constitution in the world, basically lays down framework that deals with power, structure, procedure, and duty of a government, talks about, uh, let's say, the fundamental freedoms, the directive principles of state policy, the fundamental duties. Now, this preamble to the Constitution talks about the principles, ideals, and objectives of the Constitution of India. It is indeed a mirror that shows us what the Constitution has to offer for us. 
it is in the people of india it is in you and me on whom the custody of the constitution is vested the preamble says that the constitution derives its authority from we the people of india this preamble is thus a key to the constitution however it is very interesting to know that even though when you read the constitution when you open and uh, look into the act of the direct of the constitution you will see that preamble is mentioned in the very beginning of the constitution however it was drafted that is the preamble was drafted at the last by the constituent assembly no matter what it doesn't require whether you are learned in law or you are non law person but if you read the preamble to the constitution you can understand that the constitution guarantees to all the citizens justice social economic and political it sets up justice liberty equality and fraternity as its objective the preamble also declares india to be a sovereign socialist secular democratic republic these all reflects the situation that the country was in before the coming of the constitution before the framing of the constitution the constitution if you just take up let's say uh, the part 3 of the constitution which talks about you know uh, uh, fundamental uh, rights essentially guarantees human rights it was during the colonial rule in our country that there was massive violation of human rights here and there and the idea behind giving such fundamental rights had been to protect you know the human rights of the people the freedoms that are guaranteed under part 3 of the constitution that is under the fundamental rights is with a aim and that aim is keeping the citizens at the center stage and that the citizens shall have a voice again the state if there is any violation done by the state now mind you all the fundamental rights are not only for the citizens there are also certain fundamental rights which are even available to the non citizens the very purpose of declaring you know fundamental rights was to give the people a sense of security and confidence i can even say it was more to make you know grow ourselves to help people grow and develop and realize their own potential because at the end when it comes to human rights protection of human rights the basic thing is that how you actually protect the rights of the human beings so that they could excel and progress now the constituent assembly was very eager on incorporating the fundamental rights in the constitution and let me tell you there was no doubt among the members of the constituent assembly that there should be you know no fundamental rights in the constitution they eagerly accepted the fundamental rights be there however it was something different that they had some you know uh, debate as to the exceptions that are provided in the fundamental rights provisions now this fundamental rights which i think is one of the most important right if i look at my own self as a human being 
as a citizen this fundamental rights are actually necessary outcome of the preamble itself and why when i say the necessary outcome of the preamble the reason is the preamble declares that people of india have solemnly resolved to constitute india into a sovereign democratic republic and to secure to all its citizens justice social economic and political liberty of thought expression belief faith and worship equality of status and opportunity now one very important fundamental right uh, which i would like to discuss is the right to equality now this is somewhere the heart of this fundamental right now the constitution of india guarantees right to equality and uh, it is one of the cornerstones of the indian constitution the underlying object of equality in article 14 of the indian constitution is to secure to all persons citizens or non citizens the equality of status and opportunity which is actually referred to in the preamble if you look into the wording of article 14 it very nicely says and it provides that the state will not deny to any person equality before the law and the equal protection of the laws in the territory of india now the concept of equality that is enshrined in article 14 means legal equality now there are two concepts when we talk about right to equality and when we look into the wordings of article 14 we find that there are two concepts which are involved in article 14 and these are equality before law and equal protection of laws now when you look into equality before law what does it do it actually ensures that there is no special privilege to anyone and that all are equally subject to the law of the land irrespective of his status and this is because no one is above the law now this particular provision is again not something which is an absolute provision it also has some exceptions to it examples can be taken off like let's say diplomats or you know uh, like that who can get uh, exemptions now if you look into the very next second concept which is about equal protection of laws this actually you know does not postulate anywhere equal treatment of all persons without distinction what this particular phrase equal protection of law postulates is the application uh, of the same laws alike without discrimination to persons who are situated similarly in other words it can be implied that like should be treated alike without any distinction of be it race religion wealth social status whatever it is the ultimate thing is likes must be treated alike now apart from this concept of equality that we have in the constitution there is one more thing that actually upholds each one of our uh, rights and tries to uphold and that is the concept of justice which somewhere helps us to actually uh, further our interest safeguard our interest and at the same time lead to progress and that concept uh, which is an important aspect that the constitution of india talks about is justice now these 
concept of justice is not confined only to let's say a narrow understanding of our um, concept like adjudication that happens in the court it is not confined to that you look into you know the preamble and you'll find that it has a more extensive meaning rather justice is seen as having implications in varied fields be it let's say economic polit uh, let's say political or social implications if we say for example if we talk about social justice then that denotes equal treatment meted out to all the citizens without any social discrimination here and i would like to say what pandit jawaharlal nehru actually put as an idea before the constituent assembly wherein he said first work of this assembly is to make india independent by a new constitution through which starving people will get complete meal and clothes and each indian will get best option that he can progress himself if we talk about political justice then it implies the constitution through that concept implies the equal participation by all adults in the political process you come to the economic justice and you can see that the constitution tries to mean by this concept of economic justice that there should be non discrimination between uh, between in the sense between peoples on the basis of any economic factor this framing and adoption of the constitution of india was indeed a revolutionary event in the history of india as citizens you know we should pledge to uphold and respect this cherished document and that is a thing that we as citizens and respectable citizens we should be doing we should try to understand the ethos that the constitution actually lays down the principles that it identifies as in the speeches ahead of me i heard and it was said that you know it's a living document definitely it's a living document because at the end it tries to govern a nation it tries to govern the people it tries to uplift the interest of the people and thus there are concepts of amendments in the constitution which actually looks into varied situations which calls for an immediate action and where you know there might be need to even uh, improve upon some of the provisions uh, in the constitution as because we know law is not static it is dynamic as citizens it is very important for us to understand and actually cherish the ideals that the framers of the constituent assembly had given us today standing in the 71st occasion of the constitution day i believe we are in a much fortunate position to look back and cherish our rights that had been given to us and also enjoy our rights but the situation or the time frame in which it actually came depicted the constraints the dilemmas the violations the uh, discriminations that was meted out to the people at that time and for that reason i salute the framers who had come up with such a huge document which actually cherishes our right and is given to us as a gift for all the future generation to come to enjoy and cherish the right time and again there might be issues which may come and we also have a democratic process to actually look into that dilemma the situation the discrimination that comes and this is the beautiful thing of a democracy 
the constitution actually helps us giving us a freedom of expression subject to reasonable restriction definitely where we are in a position where we can speak we can express our thought i'm scared today to think of a situation where i might just not be able uh, to express or you know curtailed off so this is the the rights that i have we have been given it's not only for us to enjoy definitely these rights are against the state and i'm not going to the definition or you know understanding of what is state because for that we have to look into a lot of cases be it ajay hasia and others to understand what is a state uh, but what i believe it's not only about the rights that the constitution gave us and we cherish it it's also the duty that we have i think each one of us should pledge to ourselves that we follow the fundamental duties which are mentioned for us because remember rights are not always absolute to every right there is a correlative duty and the duty is upon us to actually uphold the provisions of the constitution to cherish the ideals that is set up to cherish the ideals in every possible way that we live in to uphold the values and give it an uphold in such a manner that even the next generation are in a position to you know or rather let's say not in a position i would say rather they get influenced uh, to actually follow those with this words i would like to end my uh, speech today but at the uh, before i end up i would like to thank tetso college uh, department of political science for giving me an opportunity to be a part of this beautiful celebration that the department of political science conducted today thank you so much you're welcome and thank you dr samraki for your tremendous speech We are truly pleased with your words. It was great to fill our ears with your remarkable words and to have you with us today is a great honor. After 2 years, 11 months, 18 days of hard work, the Constitution of India was prepared, which was adopted by Assembly on 26 November 1949 and came into effect on 26 January 1950. And here it's prim preamble. Before reading out the preamble, I request you all to recite the preamble along with me but in course of time I request you to keep your mics muted <coughs> We the people of India having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign socialist secular democratic republic and to secure to all its citizens justice social economic and political liberty of thought expression belief faith and worship equality of status and of opportunity and to promote among them all fraternity assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity and integrity of the nation in our constituent assembly this 26th day of november 1925 1949 do hereby adopt enact and give to ourselves this constitution we have almost come to the end of today's program to end up with words of thanks I now give time to our visiting faculty assistant professor Dr. V Vijaya Chamundeswari. You may please take your time. Thank you Che. Uh greetings to everyone. I hope all of you are safe and healthy during this pandemic. So on behalf of Department of Political Science, I would like to express my gratitude to the respected keynote speaker Dr. Samragi Chakravarti and guest speaker Sir Anjan Behra for their thought provoking speeches and I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to the director principal vice principal of the college and dean of the school for uh, their motivation 
uh, for an encouragement for uh, giving us opportunity to organize these events and i would like to thank head of the department dr rimi and coordinator of this uh, commemorative event and other colleagues for their team spirit and support and i like to express my sincere appreciation to all the student speakers the chair and also the it team and on this commemorative occasion i want to say a few words i want to emphasize the role of citizens in successful pursuance of constitutional ideals and we know constitution day also observed as national law day is to commemorate the adoption of the constitution of india in 1949 on november 26 so here the significance lies in commemorating the efforts of our founding fathers in laying out a document which embodies democratic secular and socialist ideals for having liberty equality and fraternity for its citizens now the onus is on the citizens of this republic this nation to uphold these ideals envisioned by our forefathers and it is obligatory for each and every citizen of this nation to respect and follow fundamental duties enshrined in the constitution to promote the spirit of fraternity protection of the environment develop, developing scientific temper abjure violence and strive towards excellence in all spheres of life and i i uh, would like to mention few highlights and also thought provoking uh, statements by our speakers uh, first of all the keynote speaker uh, she has emphasized the role and responsibility of citizens in upholding constitutional ideals as well as she has given a legal her uh, uh opinions legal perspective uh, in making us understand how the preamble is framed and also the rights of the citizens as well as the their obligatory duties towards their nation and coming to the guest speaker he has uh, given us a very thought provoking speech today and he has questioned and uh, in fact he has uh, his uh, views are uh, i think uh, everyone will ponder over that think over uh, these burning issues uh, whether really we are ex- having equality justice and whether really the constitution is uh, in full practice in today's uh, uh, situation and i would also like to appreciate the topics uh, chosen by our students uh, because they have focused on uh burning issues like education then fundamental duties indigenous people's rights constitutional remedies which are all of uh, equal importance so uh, i want to uh thank uh, all of you once again and i look forward for more uh, thought provoking events from the department and and also with the same zeal and spirit we uh, we look forward uh, for our, everyone of your participation thank you thank you dr vijaya it was a lovely gesture to express your appreciation and also thank you for joining us today i'm dutch beyond words we the department of political science that's our college would like to thank each one of you for joining us today making it a splendid one A very special thank you to Dr. Samraki Chakraborty and Dr. Vijaya Chamundeswari for being a part of this virtual celebration, taking time out of your busy schedules. Thank you all once again and have a great day.